<laughs> we all love music. We dance to it, we cry to it, and we go to it when we need some motivation to just keep moving forward. Whether it's having a good time, or dealing with a painful breakup, or maybe even trying to set up a romantic mood for the occasion, there's always a piece of music that you can put on and just be okay. But have you ever stopped to wonder what exactly is music and what is it made of? Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rolish. I am a software engineer at BBD. And welcome to this talk where we'll be enlisting the power of computers to decode the genetic makeup of songs. I have a phobia for loud noises. And to me, they always bring a sense of impending doom. This fear has had a profound impact on my life, making me hyper aware of sounds around me. So one uneventful evening, as most evenings tend to be for someone who avoids spaces with loud music, I found myself diving down a rabbit hole of trying to understand sound in the hopes of maybe elevating this anxiety. But being someone who likes to make use of computers to test, verify, and enhance my understanding of the physical world, this curiosity quickly led down to the question of how do computers understand sound. And as I crawled down the rabbit hole, I came across a paper written by the founder and chief scientist of the popular music recognition app, Shazam, which explained how their music recognition algorithm works. This was quite a fascinating find for me because I've always found Shazam to be an amazing application of technology and the app's ability to recognize and identify songs is most impressive. So I felt that understanding how the algorithm works would be a step in the right direction towards the answer to the question of how do computers understand sound? Now from the paper, there are two things that I found most intriguing. The first was that Shazam was actually started way back in the year 2000. So I figured with the countless number of tools, computing power, and information resources at my disposal today, implementing this algorithm shouldn't be that complex of a task for me. Well, that assumption didn't age very well because implementing the algorithm wasn't exactly the smooth sailing that I thought it was going to be. And I did pull my hair out several times during the experience. So to those people who maybe last saw me before I went down this path, this is the talk that explains how I went about losing my dreadlocks. <laughs> the second thing that I found intriguing, which I know might disappoint a few people, is that contrary to modern day expectations, the algorithm didn't make use of any AI technologies, but it instead employs some digital signal processing techniques to perform what is known as audio fingerprinting. Because yes, there is still functional software that can be written without the use of AI. Now, this was particularly great for me because I like to understand concepts and ideas from first principles. So having access to the Shazam algorithm meant that I could open the black box and understand exactly what was going on under the hood. So I decided to build an application that makes use of this algorithm to identify and recognize songs. I think that the most famous saying that has to do with curiosity is that curiosity killed the cat. And this warns about the dangers of unnecessary experimentations and investigations. But my goal through this talk is to try and get you to embrace that curiosity by convincing you that while the curiosity might have killed the cat, the satisfaction 
from the outcome of that experience brought it back to life. Human fingerprints have been used as a method of identification for a very long time, more greatly so in the current age where we use them to unlock our phones, to enter places of residence, and even as forensic evidence. But the key thing to note, though, is that fingerprinting is just an extremely successful method of data reduction, where we summarize some large input data by mapping it to a much smaller data item that contains the essential information and properties of the original data. So instead of storing every possible bit of information about people, for example, we are able to map each individual to a tiny sample of data that can still uniquely identify and recognize them with a high degree of confidence, even in the presence of noise and other interferences. This same idea is the inspiration behind all audio fingerprinting techniques, where a large audio file, usually a couple of megabytes in size, is reduced to a couple of kilobytes of data that can still be used to, to uniquely identify and recognize the original data it came from at a later point in time. So at a high level, the audio fingerprinting algorithm basic principle of operation is quite simple. A known audio sample is fingerprinted, meaning that some uniquely identifying attributes are, are, are extracted from it. These attributes are then packaged into a data structure with a link to the details such as the artist's name, uh, the name of the song, and maybe the year in which the song was released. And then all of this is saved to a database. An unknown sample of audio then gets sampled. It gets fingerprinted at a later time, meaning that we extract the uniquely identifying attributes of this unknown audio sample as well. And then those fingerprints from the unknown audio sample are then merged against the large set of fingerprints previously stored in the database. And at a high level, that is how you would perform audio fingerprinting. But then this means that to perform audio fingerprinting, we first need to know what exactly these uniquely identifying attributes of music data are. And to do that, we start from the understanding of the nature of sound and how that gets into a computer system for processing. <laughs> and something is happening. Uh, Are we good? Yeah, good. As most people might already know, sound is just a vibration that propagates through some medium like air. And when this vibration gets to a computer system's microphone, it is converted to an analog electrical signal that's proportional to the strength of the vibration. So. A loud sound means a strong vibration, which would mean a strong electrical signal. And it looks like the clicker stopped working for some reason, but it's OK. Uh, Mr. Nkos. The analog signal that has now gotten or has been received by the, by the computer system, it gets sampled, meaning that we take discrete values of the original signal that we received at fixed time intervals. 
And this gives us a digital representation of sound. This digital representation of sound can then be made available to the application programs that we develop, that we write, if we correctly interface or if we correctly integrate with the computer systems sound devices. So with this understanding in mind, the first thing that I had to do was capture some audio samples from the microphone and just see what those look like. So a quick Google search on how to do this in Java pointed me in the direction of the Java Sound API. And while there are possibly other high level libraries that I could have used for the task, the Java Sound API promised to offer the lowest level of sound support in the Java platform with no batteries included. So I thought this is probably the right starting point for me. And using the Java Sound API, the application receives audio data in raw bytes, so a sequence of bits. And the first thing to do is to tell the computer how to interpret those bytes within the context of the application program that is receiving them. This specification of byte interpretation is defined through the audio format object in Java. So I created an audio processor class and defined this audio format object with a sample rate of 8,192 hertz, meaning that my application will be receiving 8,192 samples of audio data every second. I also specified through the sample size in bits property of the audio format object that each sample of data is going to be stored using 16 bits, so two bytes of data, which is a short data type. The other, uh, the other important attribute to specify is the audio in the audio format is the endianness of the data, which specifies the order in which the bytes are arranged in creating larger data types. And for that, I chose big endian, meaning that the most significant bytes or the big end is stored in the lowest memory address and the least significant bytes or the little end is stored in the highest memory address. And having defined the bytes interpretation specification through this audio format object, I also created a target data line, which is an interface that makes use of the audio format object we just defined to read audio data coming from the input device, which in the case of my application is a computer microphone. I then opened the target data line so that it's ready to start receiving some bytes from the microphone. Finally, I glued together the audio format and the target data line objects to create a method that reads in real time the bytes corresponding to the samples of the audio signal being read from the microphone. Now, a single byte is eight bits long. And in the audio format, I specified that each sample is to be represented using a short data type or 16 bits, which means I need to read two bytes of data from the microphone to fully represent one sample of audio data from the input signal. In converting two bytes to a single short data type representing an audio sample, we also need to specify the byte order that is to be used in the conversion. And this must match the endianness that we specified in the audio format object. So I also used big endian order in this conversion because that is the order in which the bytes were read from the microphone. I used the, byte, the big endian byte order for that conversion as well. And having done all of that work, I finally had a mechanism of reading some audio samples from the microphone to my application program. So that was quite an exciting moment for me. However, this excitement was very much short-lived because after doing all of that work, all I had was some changing amplitudes over time, which aren't really that useful in recognizing and identifying songs because these amplitudes are quite sensitive to the environment in which they are being captured, the volume of the sound source, and the point in time at which we start capturing the data.
and I think I moved to a head there. So while it would be a simple task for a human to identify and recognize songs under all these changing conditions in time, this isn't such an easy task for computers to do because all of those changes also change the binary representation of the audio data itself. This means that we need to look at the sound data from a different perspective. And the Shazam paper mentions doing this in the frequency domain, which luckily I knew how to do. I took the discrete Fourier transform of the captured audio samples. And this is just a mathematical operation that allows us to view the frequency spectrum of a signal, showing both the frequencies that are present in that signal and how much of each frequency is present. So if you were to view a single frequency tone, for example, in both the time and frequency domain, you would get an oscillating graph in the time domain and a vertical line in the frequency domain, since that's the only frequency that's present in that signal. So that's what the Fourier transform operation allows us to do. Now, while the frequency spectrum of an audio signal tells us about the frequencies that are present in the entire duration of the signal, it doesn't tell us when in time such frequencies occur. And for audio signals, this information is quite important because it is these changes in frequencies over time that give songs the characteristics that we perceive as music. So to address this issue of missing time information in the frequency spectrum of an audio signal, we instead partition the time domain input signal into several disjointed or overlapped blocks, and then apply the discrete Fourier transform to each block of the signal. This then gives us the short time frequency composition of the song. So it allows us to see when in time certain frequencies actually okay, if you specify the right resolution. This operation, creatively called the short time Fourier transform, gives us a different perspective from which to view audio data, giving us a three-dimensional view of audio signals with a frequency component, a time component, and a magnitude component that, that indicates how much of each frequency is present in a given period of time. This is the spectrogram view of audio data, and it's usually represented with the frequency and time axis on the X and Y, and the Z axis or the third dimension represented by a color, such that we get an image view of the sound signal. And we can have each color be associated with how much energy is present for that frequency at that time, and that's what gives the varying colors from the spectrogram view of the audio data. Now, a spectrogram contains a lot of information about the audio signal. And saving all of this data as a fingerprint would be both memory and compute intensive. So we need to extract as little details as possible from the spectrogram. The Shazam algorithm identifies peak points from the spectrogram, which are points that have the highest energy content in their surrounding neighborhood. And that reduces the spectrogram to a constellation map of the song. Peak points are used here because they are the most likely points to remain present in the spectrogram view of a song when noise and other distortions are also present in the surrounding environment. From the constellation map, we then perform something known as combinatorial hash generation and while this might sound like some fancy and complex idea, all we are doing is picking a single peak at a time, which we call an anchor point. And then we pair that with a certain number of other peaks that occur in what is known as the target zone of that anchor point. This is then repeated for every peak in the constellation map where it gets selected as an anchor point and then paired with subsequent points in its target zone.
for each pair of an anchor point and a peak in its target zone, we generate a fingerprint hash, which is just an object that contains information about the frequency of the anchor point, the frequency of the peak point in the target zone, and the time difference between the peaks. We then apply a hash function to these attributes such that we end up with a 32-bit integer hash value, which is the fingerprint hash for two peaks in the spectrogram. This hash value is then stored in the database together with the time offset of the anchor point from the start of the audio capturing process and a link to the metadata of the original song from which the fingerprint was generated. This time offset is not part of the hash value, but it is later used when we want to perform matching on an unknown sample of that to that of an unknown of, of a known stored sample in the database. And I feel like I've probably said a lot of things here that some of it might make sense, some of it might not make sense as yet, but it is my hope that when we merge theory, some visualizations maybe, and an application that actually makes use of the exact concepts that we were defining, I hope that does bridge the gap between what I might have been missed at some point and later discovered as we go on with the process. So having said all of that, I feel like at this point, I would like to just show you an application that makes use of all these concepts that we just defined and explain through that how each of the steps that we took in implementing this audio fingerprinting algorithm worked. And to do that, I will switch to another screen here. So I have a database with only two tables. One is to store the fingerprints for each song that we fingerprint, meaning we are extracting those uniquely identifying attributes of it. And the other table is just to store the song metadata. So this is who these fingerprints belong to. Now, so those are the two tables that we have, the fingerprint hash table and the song metadata table. And in the song metadata table, I have a couple of songs that I've already fingerprinted. And I just want to put it out there that these songs have absolutely nothing to do with anything that is happening in my life. So <laughs> such information should not be inferred from them. Um, so if we check, for example, what exactly is in the song metadata table, it looks like we have a couple of J. Cole songs, some Ed Sheeran song, some Lil Wayne song, and these were not chosen from anywhere in any particular order for any particular reason. And I just feel like I should emphasize that. So that's what we have. We have a couple of songs that have already been fingerprinted. And I did this beforehand because fingerprinting a whole song means doing it for the duration of the actual song, which takes a long time. Now, if maybe we were just to see what some contents of the fingerprint hash table looks like, we could do uh, fingerprint hash, and let's just say five of that. And that's what uh, the fingerprint hash table data looks like. And what we see there is we have the anchor time offset, which is the time at which the offset peak that we used in the fingerprint occurred during the spectrogram view of the ODA data that we have. And then the integer value that we have is the hash that was generated by combining the frequencies of, the bo of both the anchor point and the point that existed in the target zone of that peak. And then we just also have like a link to the metadata for which that hash information is linked to. So for example, all of the data that we are currently seeing is linked to some song by someone called J. Cole, and the name of the song seems to be 3001. So that is what we have as our database. Now, the next thing that we now have to do is we have a database. Let's connect it to an application. 
And that's what we are going to do here. this guy takes a bit of time to start up only today for whatever reason And finally, we have something that runs. And knowing that there's a lot of people with a lot of different skills in this room, the other thing that I just want to say is um, my UI UX development skills are not on point, <laughs> but it's functional, I hope. Um, and I think that should make the difference. So I just built a little thing that looks like this. It's all in Java. And I think this is the best type of UI that you can get if you are building the entire thing using Java Swing. Um, so what I have here with this application is I can tell it to match, which means listen to whatever that is playing in the surrounding environment. And that's the first thing that I needed to do because to verify that I am indeed capturing audio samples and to verify that these are indeed coming from my microphone, I needed to visually see that to actually believe it to be true. So I implemented a component, which is just the panel at the top, to show these changing amplitudes over time, which is typically what you would see in audio visualizers uh, if you were to check what, what that looks like. And then the next thing that I built is the component or the panel at the bottom, which is the spectrogram view of the same audio song. So we see those changing amplitudes in time and then we see what those changing frequencies over time for that very song, song looks like. So if I was to go match and start speaking, it, you can actually see that as I say something, there is that picking of the audio samples that are being read from the microphone. And at the bottom, we start to generate the spectrogram view of the same song. Uh, corresponding to the changing in frequencies over time that we are seeing for that song. So getting these amplitudes changing over time was great. And the next thing that I needed to do was verify that my spectrogram view uh, was also correct. So to do that, the first thing that I did, the simplest test that I could do was I am going to play a single frequency tone or a pure tone, right? Which is just like some sinusoid, the sine graph or something. Um, and the expectation from that, I already know what I expected to see in the spectrogram view because we only have one frequency in that tone and the spectrogram uses the intensity of a particular frequency in what is being played to show that this is the most dominant frequency that we have. So if I play a single, pure, uh, a single frequency tone and then run that through the spectrogram, I should see just a horizontal line showing that at this frequency, this is where most of the energy for the signal is concentrated. So I did that. I generated such a pure tone. And I am going to play it and just show you what this application then does after that. Hopefully, it's not going to be as noisy. So the tone that I'm playing here is actually at 852 hertz. 
So that's where we expect the horizontal line to sort of like be brighter than the surrounding areas because that is the frequency at which our tone is playing. And that's what we get there. And I thought that was cool. But then in my many nights of exploring and diving down different rabbit holes that have to do with sound, I came across some information that specified that there are certain people who actually do hide some sort of images in songs, if we can call them that, because uh, having went down to actually listen to them, I think it came across to me more as noise. And that is my way of apologizing before I play that to you. Um, so I, I, I went to the internet and I searched for such songs and I wanted to see those images to see exactly what was hidden in them. And that was going to be a confirmation enough that my spectrogram implementation is correct because the spectrogram is that key or that central to the implementation of the fingerprinting algorithm itself. So to that, um, I went into the internet and I found some song, if it's a song. Uh, it's called Look, and in parentheses, they say songs about my cats. And what I was expecting to see there is some cats as I view the same audio signal through the spectrogram view. And I'm going to play that song uh, and see what we get. Seems like my audio player is playing this thing in a loop. Uh, that is regenerating this thing over time. So I'll just play it from the source and have it visualized from the songs about my cats. There we go. And let's do it. And I do hope that you get to see this one at least, but it doesn't seem to be the case over there. Uh, but just take my word for it. <laughs> uh, because that is what I used to actually verify that my spectrogram implementation was indeed correct. Uh, it's unfortunate I couldn't get this resolution right. It seems to get it to properly display over there. But it's what I could see here if maybe after the talk, somebody can come and be like, show it to me that's what i will do uh, but for now i think you can just take my word for it so now having done that i was now confident in my app's ability to recognize songs and to do that i was like let me go to one of these places that play loud music and just see what they're playing and maybe my laptop will be able to pick up whatever that they are playing. So this is something that I found them playing, nothing to do with 
anything that's happening in my life. It's just song, a song they were playing. And I didn't know the song, so I was like, let's know what the song is. So we do that, and we are going to see start matching after we play the song. I was younger then. Take me back to when we found weekend jobs and when we got paid, we buy cheap spirits and drink them straight. Me and my friends have not thrown up in so long. Oh, how we've grown. But I can't wait to go home. I'm on my way. Driving at night. See down up country lake. Singing to tiny dancer. And I miss the way you make me feel. It's real when we watch the sunset over the cars of only you. Over the cars of only you. And, <laughs> and unfortunately, we got the song wrong. But that happens because what happened is I fingerprinted these songs playing from my phone in my room and i was like i'm gonna play the same songs on stage in a book big room like this and be able to identify them from that which unfortunately wasn't the case in this instance but that does happen you do get false positives just as hallucinations were said to be something that can be good sometimes uh it's fun to know what could go wrong and then what would cause that and for this one it seems our application came to the wrong conclusion. But that, as it may, uh, it still gets a couple of stuff right. And even though it didn't get it right this time, you can take my word for it. So, as I now reflect on this journey, from the moment I first wondered about how sound works, to the countless hours spent deciphering the mysteries of audio fingerprinting, I realized that it was curiosity that led me down this winding path. There were moments of frustration, countless dead ends, and times I, ser I seriously considered giving up. But each step forward, each and every small breakthrough fueled my desire to keep going. And now, standing on the other side, I can say with certainty that the struggle was worth it. Because not only did I gain a deeper understanding of both sound and computer audio, but I also learned something fundamental and invaluable in the process which is the power of curiosity to drive us towards new horizons. And at the end of this sonic journey, I was reminded by the words of Albert Einstein, who said about himself, I know quite certainly that I myself have no special talent, but curiosity, obsession, and dogged endurance combined with self-criticism have brought me to my ideas. And with that, I say, while curiosity might have killed this cat countless times, the satisfaction of the whole exploration always brought it back to life. So stay hungry, stay foolish. And when the going gets tough, there's always a piece of music that you can put on and just be OK. Thank you. Any questions? Um, so uh, since you, you can like uh, hide music, 
uh, sorry, hide images in the in the in the sounds. Can you also hide uh, something like a bug, probably like a series of uh, bias bias that would like break the whole program or? <laughs> I don't know about them breaking the whole program because uh, you are not really executing the bytes that make up the image itself, but you can change them to be whatever you feel like and see what that looks like. Yeah. Fantastic talk, thank you. Um, I have two questions. One of them is how many, how many fingerprints you need to pre-record per minute to have an accurate um, uh, recognition? And the second, how Shazam make it work so that we can capture sound from any time code in the sound and get an accurate, re they don't expect us to start at a specific yes. moment. It, it can start and end at any point in the, so how many fingerprints per song and all the time things works. Okay. So the first one to how many fingerprints I, so I didn't go down to exactly, this is the number of fingerprints that you need to take uh, so what I did is I played around multiple times over and over again with it. I fingerprinted multiple songs and then I was checking when I get an accurate sort of like reading for it, what was uh, the time needed, sort of like the time limit that I so pushed to many songs in terms of how long I would need to listen to, to actually get an accurate reading for it. Uh, so what this currently does is it's going to listen for 30 seconds right so in that 30 seconds whatever peaks that get extracted from the 30 second sample uh, that's what gets meshed against uh the fingerprint hash database so i didn't do it in terms of the number of samples but or, or, or fingerprints but just in time right and then the next question of how they they actually get it right uh to start the song at any point and then still find a match to that is if you take, for example, the constellation map view that I explained before, where we have all these peaks, right? So we've sort of like downsized the, the image data that we have to whatever peaks that, uh, that are in that space. And then we sort of like generate those ashes out of them. Now, if you were, for example, to, because you generated them for the whole song, and if you were to play another sample of audio data at a later time, starting at whatever point that you start it, right? You can think of it as sliding the spectrogram or the constellation map of the new song over the entire database. And then at some time offset, right? Which is what the time offset that I said isn't part of the edge value is actually used for. At some time offset, those things actually start to align and then you get more alignment on it. So what the algorithm does is if it find hashes in the database that are sort of like corresponding to this song, it doesn't automatically say this is the song because other songs as well might have the same fingerprints, but not in the same sort of like order that they were read in initially, right? So what it does is it selects all of those as candidate sort of like potential songs, which is why what happened here is that even within the potential songs that it came with, uh, it still chose the wrong one out of the ones that it found. So what it does is uh, out of all those potential candidates now, when you do that sliding around like of the spectrogram itself to find like those corresponding at some time offset points, right? You sort of like generate a, a histogram that shows like for this song, this is like the peak height that I got for it. This is, this is the... the first three songs are my favorite <laughs> um so i just wanted to know uh with your program that you were creating like what inspired you, you to create uh, or look into uh, frequencies of sound or were you looking at something like sound therapy of um maybe stimulating uh cells at different frequencies like in in sound uh, therapy so it's what motivated me to do this <laughs> uh so two things, I, 
I read the paper because I tend to do that quite often. And then I thought, whatever that was explained, there sounds like something that I can do, right? Um, so that was the first point to it. And the second one was escape. I, I actually built the whole thing for escape. <laughs> So yeah, when uh, the, the call for papers for ESCAPE came out, I was like, I read this paper and it was something that I wanted to do. This is a great opportunity to do it on. And then I went for it because I mean, the good thing about uh, having like that time pressure that ESCAPE gives you is that it forces you to finish your work, right? Whereas with some of the things, it's easier to just say, I'm gonna start and then it never gets to an, to, to an end. So this felt like a definite project start and an end and yeah that's what got it here thank you knowledge thank you everyone we're gonna have a 45 minute break and then we're back at quarter two two um our next talk will be by shina okunel uh title is testing python web apps using playwright thank you